convenience into the benefit. Building our own project in that way, resilient, we decided to harness the synergy achieved through communication with the invited speakers, a powerful group of experts and researchers from across the world as a ferment of a wider multi-component project within the scope of our project, of our topic. One component is a publication, an edited book, which combines discussions on general theoretical approach, international perspective and policies, as well as local and particular case studies. The book, hopefully, will be released by mid-June next, next year. Given that the online gatherings during COVID-19 restrictions have become the luck of the Drew, the other component is a number of webinars which will take part before the face-to-face -face conference in 2021 is realistic, and which are starting with this one today. A number of the authors who have contributed to the book and who will speak at the coming conference or the webinars are with us today. I thank you, dear colleagues, for tuning in, and I'm looking forward to your participation in the discussion. The notion of social, economic, and psychological potential of heritage in post-trauma recovery process has been addressed in many discussions and publications and recognized in a number of case studies. There is no doubt today that the ethics of cultural heritage conservation in post-trauma does not stop at the respect for original material and authentic documents, but goes beyond it into the fields of human rights, humanitarian issues, justice, social cohesion, and complexity of sustainable development. That is why we have invited a number of psychologists anthropologists, sociologists, and economists to contribute to the heritage discourse through our project. The conference, the publication, and the webinars on integrated post-disaster reconstruction of cultural heritage, social, economic, and psychological aspects of its recovery are building upon a number of past activities aimed at the evolving and the context adaptable guidance on post-disaster heritage reconstruction and recovery. It is intended to be a follow-up of two important projects that resulted in Warsaw recommendation on recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage in 2018 and the culture in city reconstruction and recovery cure position paper of UNESCO and World Bank from the same year. The outcomes of the project should achieve synergy with the ECOMOS ECROM Global Case Study Project on Recovery and Reconstruction, as well as with a number of the ECROM programs being conducted under the labels of the people-centered approach, first aid to cultural heritage, heritage and resilience, etc. Underlining that humans, both as individuals and communities, have been the central targets of heritage destruction, a fact only recently recognized in international judicial practice, we have drafted the following objectives. To continue the reflection on the recovery and reconstruction of world heritage properties, as requested by the World Heritage Committee in its decision 7.2, passed on the 43rd session in 2019 in Baku. To contribute to the concerted work on the promotion of the quickly responsive, mutually harmonized, holistic, and community context appropriate sustainable and development oriented principles, policies, and operational guidelines for integrated heritage reconstruction and establish them as targets of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030. The targets should lead to the actions which will be participative, people-centered, cost 
benefit attentive, inclusive, and prosperity oriented problem solving. To objectivize the capacities of modern technologies and traditional skills and their potentials in integrated post trauma heritage reconstruction and recovery. To discuss the continuity between the various dimensions of cultural heritage and its economic aspects with respect to heritage economics in process of post disaster reconstruction and recovery. And to contribute to the discourse and strategy of forming international synergic actions of solidarity and responsibility in building resilience of people through recovery and reconstruction of heritage, especially attending the needs of the most vulnerable groups, which are in the whirlpools of suffering. The issue of heritage reconstruction and recovery has been marked with a number of challenges in 2020. The major of which are linked with the complexity of the social and economic environment caused by COVID-19 pandemic and the health protection measures. The communities which have already suffered significant economic ruination and social trauma are now faced with a deeper distress which affects all segments of their lives, including their heritage. The questions are competing over each other. What do multidimensional poverty, massive displacement and homelessness combined with a health crisis have to do with revaged cultural heritage and cultural memory pushed into oblivion? Does heritage reconstruction have a potential to cope with the cum cumulative social and economic distress caused by war, armed conflict, and often other devastating disasters triggered by natural hazards in the situation of global trauma? Can the paradigms of resilience and building back better be related to both people and heritage sites while taking into consideration the full richness of their authenticity as the Venice Charter demands in its preamble. The objective of the first webinar, Cultural Heritage and People, Building Resilience in the Superimposed Traumas, is to contribute to the quest for the efficient, sound and sustainable solutions. One, and sometimes more than one, devastating events superimposing over each other and affecting both people and heritage, the global economic recession, limited physical communications and extreme health precautions are appealing for urgent response. Some of the most vulnerable heritage sites have been affected by new disasters in 2020. Our panelists will refer to three cases marked by devastating blast in Beirut on August 4th this year, refire of the tombs of Buganda kings at Kasubi in Kampala on June 5th this year, following their reconstruction from the previous fire in 2010, and the heavy rains and flash floods in Yemen during August, going in parallel with the armed conflict. These and the number of other cases are pointing to the must of restructuring knowledge, capacities and resources, as well as redesign of the reconstruction and recovery concepts and priorities. Addressing the issues of the reconstruction of cultural heritage and post-trauma recovery in the COVID-19 context, panelists at the first session will share knowledge and experience on general and global concerns, such as responding to challenges of reconstruction and recovery of World Heritage Sites, 
which will be presented by Dr. Mechthild Rosler, Director of World Heritage Center in UNESCO. Or solutions for technical and conservation dilemma, dilemma imposed by usually the same intermittent occurrence of the same devastating disasters and the demand to achieve resilience through reconstruction projects of international solidarity, which will be presented by Dr. Maya Kominko from Alif. And the symbiosis of the concerns for the sustainable recovery of both youth and heritage in distressed communities, which is the topic of uh, Dr. Shadia Tukang, director of Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. I kindly ask Mohammed to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Mehtild Rustler, director of World Heritage Center, whose strength and knowledge inspire. And I would like to thank you especially for being today with us, despite her very busy agenda. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Amra, for this very instructive and elaborated introduction. It gave us all an interesting and clear framework of the following intervention. We are uh, very honored today to have such a diverse and uh, rich expertise in this field with presentations which are relevant to each other's and I'm sure we'll have a number of important questions at the end during the Q&A uh, session and I invite all the attendees to not hesitate to start writing us their questions to be addressed by the speakers uh, later on today. So the first contribution is uh, from a long standing friend of ARCWH as she was introduced briefly by uh, Dr. Amra. The Dr. Mestil Drosler, the director of the World Heritage Center, uh, the main partner of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage and the implementation of the World Heritage Convention, from whom we are very thankful for the continuous support and collaboration. So Dr. Mestil sent us her recording pre recorded presentation and she will hopefully with, will be uh, with us during the question and answer sessions to react on the inquiries and questions that will be addressed to her. Before we start with the video, as mentioned by uh, our friend, Dr. Amra, we will introduce Dr. Meshtil. So Dr. Meshtil Drosler is the director of the World Heritage Center at UNESCO. She's an expert in both cultural and natural heritage and the history of planning. In, 91, or in 1991, Dr. Rosler joined UNESCO where she held different positions. In 2015, she was appointed as the director of the Division of, for Heritage and the director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center. She has published and co-authored 13 books and more than 100 articles, including Many Voices, One Vision, The Early History of the World Heritage Convention, together with uh, Dr. Christina Cameron in 2013, a very important contribution to the history of the convention and its evolution, by the way. So uh, Dr. Meshtil will uh, speak about World Heritage Sites and how global reconstruction and recovery challenges are addressed. And I invite my colleague in charge of uh, streaming the video from Dr. Meshtil to start it. Please, Leila, go ahead. one we have experienced this year and it of course impacts the work we are doing on recovery rehabilitation and reconstruction so i would like first of all to thank the arab regional center for world heritage in bahrain and in particular sheikh bint mohammed al khalifa as well as the whole team of rwh and of course amra for organizing this uh, very important uh, center over the past years and this is my first slide we have seen the consequences violent extremism seeking to destroy to loot and traffic cultural heritage especially in the middle east and in africa violent extremism 
do not seek to destroy buildings only. Their objective is to impose a sectarian and exclusive vision of life. Our response must go beyond the protection and even the physical reconstruction of buildings and cities. It is about protecting who we are and what we believe in through education, knowledge, through scientific research, freedom of expression. We deplore all the violence, deaths and suffering endured by people and we strongly support all ongoing efforts to build reconciliation and peace in countries concerned, especially in the Middle East. Too many cultural heritage sites have been destroyed or are in great danger. Cultural heritage has suffered collateral damage in this conflict. Cultural heritage has been the target of deliberate destruction in Iraq, uh, Libya, and Syria. Experience has shown that such senseless destruction and persecution makes reconciliation between the conflicting parties much more difficult in the future. Let me go to slide number two. In these difficult times, it is our shared responsibility to do everything in our power to mitigate the risk of destruction of cultural heritage and keep alive its traditions and practices, but also to give hope and start with recovery programs wherever possible. On reconstruction issues, I would like to highlight the paragraph 56 of the operational guidelines for the implementation of the World Heritage Convention, which clarifies the World Heritage Committee's position. It says, in relation to authenticity, the reconstruction of archaeological remains or historic buildings or districts is justifiable only in exceptional circumstances. Construction is acceptable only on the basis of complete and detailed documentation and no to, uh, to no extent to conjecture. Now let's go to uh, slide number three um, on the Warsaw meeting. Experiences from the city of Warsaw are among the most valuable in terms of reconstruction and recovery. A UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1980, the historic center of Warsaw, so more than 85% of the buildings destroyed by Nazi troops. After the war, a five-year reconstruction campaign by its citizens resulted in today's a meticulous reconstruction of the old town with churches, palaces, and marketplace. It took almost over 40 years to restore the whole city to its pre-war glory, relying on detailed archival documentation, and this relates to what I have just uh, said, and the value of expertise of local art historians, architects, and conservators. The result today is the city reborn demonstrating an incredible wealth of Polish expertise in the field of heritage preservation and reconstruction. In May 2018, an international group of experts reflected the specific context of world heritage and the challenges of its recovery. More than 200 participants from 30 countries got to develop the most appropriate universe guidelines for moving forward with properties of exceptional value at the time of destruction, acknowledging that in post-conflict and post-disaster these situations, the overall goal is the recovery of society. Let's go to slide number four. The Warsaw Recommendation proposes non-exhaustive set of guiding principles related to several important issues to be addressed in the recovery process. They provide an overall theoretical and conceptual framework in addressing post-conflict reconstruction. International charters in this area, in particular the e-commerce charters and recommendations that have guided the implementation of the Heritage Convention for decades, serve as points of reference. However, the scale instructions globally and the internal destructions brought us together for more in-depth reflections and to discuss issues related to rebuilding national identities, restoring social cohesion, integration, education against violent extremism, and healing collective traumas, which is one of our topics. These tools allow to base our reflection for the recovery of the world heritage properties on a solid theoretical basis. They invite us to understand the values that justify the inscription on the world heritage and the associative, associated attributes before making a decision on a proposed rehabilitation and reconstruction. Let's go to number five. 
Um, they also invite us to ensure that decisions on recovery follow people-centered approaches and fully engage local communities, enabling people to connect to their heritage, identity, and history. In reconstructing heritage, consideration should be given to social justice and property titles, and rights-based approaches should be applied, which ensure full participation in cultural life, uh, freedom of expression, access to cultural heritage, for all individuals and groups. In every reconstruction program, the prior and informed consent of local communities to key decisions should be ensured in accordance with the relevant position, the provisions of the operational guidelines and the 2015 policy on the integration of a sustainable development perspective in processes of the World Heritage Convention. In slide number six, I will go to resilience, memory and reconciliation also need to ensure that local communities understand and integrate into the restoration process the identified values, including new values resulting from the traumatic events of the reconstruction, as well as those related to physical attributes. Culture represents an anchor of stability. It constitutes a foundation on which countries and people can hope to build their lives. In the recovery, the cultural heritage often becomes a strong symbol and a tool for rebuilding communities, actively helping them to break the cycles of violence. UNESCO's conviction is that culture in the broadest sense, respect for diversity, a pluralistic approach, and the protection of cultural rights of all is essential for building peace, dialogue, and sustainable development. Let's go to slide number seven. The World Heritage Committee fully endorsed the Warsaw recommendation, which, thanks to the collaboration between Poland and Tom, is now also published in Arabic. Very useful for our meeting today. The committee also requested the World Heritage Center, ICOMOS, and ICROM, and the state's parties to report back on any progress in terms of reconstruction and recovery. Since 2018, the item reconstruction figures and the state of conservation item on the agenda of discussions at the World Heritage Committee. It ensures a global debate through the framework of this universal convention with now 194 state parties. In slide number eight, I look at other documents. At UNESCO, we are also addressing post-conflict reconstruction by building knowledge through damage assessment and documentation and by identifying the needs and priorities in the framework of broader land operations with the related expertise. As one of the results of the renewed partnership between UNESCO and the World Bank, a joint position paper on culture in city construction and recovery was launched in November 2018, focusing on urban regeneration, creative economy, resilience, and disaster risk management. This position paper reflects on how to provide a stronger, multidisciplinary response to the damage faced by cities, especially under the shared belief that culture is the key in recovery to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Culture is what brings cities to life. It is the tie that binds places to their communities, what gives meaning to their inhabitants, the source, expression, and passing of traditions, the symbol of beliefs, stories, and practices. This position paper is based on several case studies that take stock of good and other practices in the reconstruction of cities such as Beirut, Tokyo, Kathmandu, etc. Some other case studies have been commissioned by the World Heritage Center thanks to the support of the Netherlands Fund and will be soon available on the World Heritage Center webpage uh, on post-conflict and post-disaster reconstruction and recovery. Um, Actually, two papers by AMRA on uh, reconstruction and healing, Bosnia, and uh, a case study of Sarajevo are also included there. Now, uh, in slide nine, um, we will go to another topic. History has also shown us that each case is unique. The situation of cities and their rebuilding after conflict and disasters provide an opportunity to understand to what extent reconstruction is a complex endeavor and that each case has to be carefully analyzed to find the best approaches. 
history has demonstrated that symbolic acts such as the rebuilding of old Mosta Bridge, uh, the reconstruction of the old city town of Dubrovnik, or the historic center of so just mentioned, constitutes acts of representation, reconciliation of communities to come to terms with collective trauma. Two of these sites were inscribed on the World Heritage List after the reconstruction. Now let's go to the Mali case in slide number 10. During recovery, the rehabilitation of the cultural heritage he helped healing the scars of war and conflict. Initiatives to safeguard, protect, and rebuild Mali's cultural heritage, in particular the World Heritage Site of Timbuktu, represent just one of the recent examples of potential cultural conflict situation to deal with collective traumas. It is also an excellent example of linking tangible and intangible heritage, as well as use and job creation and cooperation between local communities and international support. In slide number 11, I would like to go to Bamia. When wars and conflict come to halt, rebuilding plans are likely to start very quickly, but institutional frameworks and national capacities may be inadequate. Paradoxically, reconstruction time can have an additional adverse effect cultural heritage. Cultural heritage conservation, rehabilitation and reconstruction require in-depth research, multidisciplinary cooperation, integrated planning and involves a wide array of parameters and knowledge systems. In Bamiya, reflection on the reconstruction of the Buddhas after their destruction in March 2003 by the Taliban is still ongoing and was subject to many international things. Uh, UNESCO uh, just published a book entitled The Future of the Banyan Buddha Statute um, Heritage Reconstruction in Theory and Practice, providing an important record and current discussion of the potential reconstruction of the Bamiyan Buddha statutes. And I believe this is really something uh, from which we can learn from, uh, from these debates in which I currently participate. So number 11, a year ago, on 18 September 2019, we organized a technical meeting at UNESCO headquarters and looked into the future of the site of Palmyra. Reflecting on the future of this property is also a way of paying tribute to the ones whose lives were taken on the site, harnessing the very strong symbolic way of your site of Palmyra at crossroads of several civilizations is a way to initiate rebuilding the foundations which people can hope to rebuild their lives. At the end of the meeting, the experts agreed on the principle that no reconstruction will be carried out in the immediate phase. The feasibility of any reconstruction um, should would need to be undertaken for a detailed assessment of damages to monumental structures and elements um, and as the, uh, of the site as a whole. Further discussion and reflection on any reconstruction would be need to be considered holistically by integrating the OUV with all other side values that are important to the community and taking into account international standards. You may have seen in publication Time Temple in Palmyra, no Temple in Palmyra, a plea against the reconstruction of the Bell Temple by a German author. It shows that the debates on reconstruction can be quite divisive and need to be managed carefully. Moreover, in working on the OUV at heritage sites, and while international decisions are without any doubt an issue of sovereignty, there needs to be a transparent international consultation, uh, for example, dedicated committees to ensure integrated approach that's fully uh, take on board the values of the site. And we also need to ensure that political processes do not undermine scientific and that planning is fully transparent, participatory, and equitable. Slide number 12 in Nepal. In 2018, we have published with our UN partner, the satellite imaginary, imagery program, UNITA UNOSAT, a full assessment of the destruction of cultural heritage in Aleppo immediately following the cessation of the hostilities in December 2016. The publication provides a very good assessment and our different experts determine the severity of historic loss and in some cases, uh, destruction 
of key historical events within the broader cultural site and is available online. The publication um, on Syria, which we are just finalizing, uh, follows the same model, assessing uh, satellite images uh, of the damages um, resulting from the conflict in six world heritage properties and 10 sites inscribed on the tentative list. And uh, we have included also a number of important other sites. And uh, this um, analysis damages um, directly after the station of um, uh, combat and provides an essential foundation to address the complex uh, challenges in organizing reconstruction and recovery on the sites. Now, in uh, slide 14, you see the Milo Church, um, which was in April 2020 uh, seriously affected by a fire, um, which is inside of the World Heritage property of the National Historic Park Citadel Sans Souci in Haiti. Despite the constraints uh, also imposed in Haiti by the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been possible to support to the Heritage Emergency Fund the production of key architectural documentation of the church prior to the fire and the documentation which constitutes more than 350 raw pictures and 3D model screenshots dating back from 2014, <coughs> excuse me, represents essential pre-disaster uh, baseline data. In slide 16, we have to go to key initiatives. Similarly, we reflected on reconstruction recovery in urban context, uh, specifically uh, through the approach, the historic urban landscape recommendation in the 2015 Aleo expert meetings and in ECOMOS workshop 2016-17 and with ECROM also in 2017. We have also the initiative by the Director General of UNESCO after the destruction of Mosul and destruction of Beirut following explosions this year, where the 2011 recommendation on the historic urban landscape <clears throat> provides great support. In the process, we need to take into account social, economic, environmental, color, and other considerations. We also need to decide on what needs to remain in our collective memory, why and how. In any case, we need to ask ourselves whether reconstruction can be an option to restore lost symbols that represent important references for the history of art and architecture and for the community's concern. And when should such a drastic choice would need to be considered? In this regard, the reconstruction of Mostar Bridge of Timbuktu's Mamiens seems to be an evident choice. And my last slide in uh, slide 17, in the way forward, we uh, think uh, we will continue the reflection for recovery and reconstruction of world heritage properties with our advisory bodies and the state's parties. Um, and I think we continue providing support uh, to state's parties, uh, for instance, through international technical meetings, assistance to the World Heritage Fund, coordination task forces, etc. And I'm very happy. Uh, to report back to the World Heritage Committee in 2021 uh, on recovery and reconstruction activities at World Heritage Properties on, on the implementation of the Warsaw Recommendation. In this sense, I would be also very pleased to brief the 41st session of the World Heritage Committee on the event day and further share another building stone in our global debate. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Rassler, for this wonderful, systematic uh, and very inspiring presentation. Uh, I would like to invite Mohammed to present our, to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Maya Kominko, coming from Ale. Okay, I join you, uh, Dr. Amra, to thank uh, Dr. Meshtil for her uh, very inspiring presentation and. Um, gave a good understanding of the global context of the effort on reflecting on the reconstruction and the challenges. So the, um, the following uh, speaker is from uh, the Elif Foundation, uh, an institution that has already extensively marked the, the field of recovery and rehabilitation uh, despite its, uh, its recent creation. 
uh, by supporting heritage local communities globally. Alif is represented today by uh, Dr. Maja Komingu, that we warmly welcome among us. So Dr. Ma Maja Komengu is the Scientific and Program Director at Alif Foundation in Geneva. She was previously the Director of Cultural Program at the Arcadia Fund in London. She has studied, taught and researched at universities in Poland, Italy, United Kingdom, Turkey, the United States and Sweden. Her research focuses on cultural and intellectual history of the Middle East in late antique and medieval per periods. She will be talking today about post-conflict conservation and the notion of building better. Kindly, Dr. Maya, if I may, you have the floor. Thank you so very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful webinar. I'm afraid I do not have beautiful pictures, but um, the good news is that my presentation shouldn't take longer than 10 minutes. Um, and I thought I would outline some problems and issues for discussion together because, as you mentioned, Alif is a new organization. We come to this topic with a great humility and we are very eager to learn from our colleagues um, who, who work in the field. So Alif was established in 2017. It is an international foundation which offers support to heritage in conflict and post-conflict areas. And our ambition is to protect heritage in a way that contributes to peace and resilience. Since 2017, Alif has funded 100 projects in 22 countries to the value of 38 million of US dollars. We select our projects uh, through annual, annual calls for applications. For emergency projects, we also have a rolling application for support of up to $75,000. And in 2020, we offered small targeted funding stream with grants of up to 15,000 for emergencies related to COVID-19. Few words about my title. We all have seen this phrase a lot in 2020, but as you all know, the strategy is not new. Uh, building back better is an approach to post-disaster recovery that reduces vulnerability to future disasters and build communities resilience. It stresses the need for donors and aid agencies to recognize that communities drive their own recovery, that recovery must promote fairness and equity, and that it must help to prepare for future disasters. The benefits of such approach seem clear. If we agree that heritage preservation projects should be carried out within the framework of broader recovery, which regrettably is not always the case, the disconnect from social and economic development sometimes leads to a situation where, as one local interview aptly described, the, co the local communities are left with eyes full but pockets empty. We recognize that to be successful and sustainable, the recovery must be driven by local people. This, however, is not always easy for heritage conservation projects in regions where rebuilding of the roads, schools, hospitals remains a pressing concern. Um, the, uh, there is another difficulty in involving local communities because it is not always clear how to define who is the local community and who can speak on its behalf. Fundamentally, a community is a group of people whose views might diverge and building back better requires inclusiveness and equity, which means giving voices to everyone, not only to those whose voices were heard traditionally. Another issue, especially in cases of active religious heritage, um, placing emphasis on is potentially placing emphasis on one historical or religious identity, which might lead to further rift between different religious or ethnic communities. This is particularly problematic in countries which recover from conflict that might have happened along these fault lines. It is therefore imperative to preserve heritage in its diversity in a way that contributes to social cohesion rather than enhances division between heritage communities. Alif always strives to work in partnership with people and institutions on the ground. Yet our experience has taught us that in post-war recovery, external expertise is often necessary, at least at the beginning. We try to ensure that this does not create dependence. Um, we ask that all projects are carried out in partnerships with local institutions and that there is a transfer of necessary skills so that the local organizations gradually can run projects on their own. Finally, but very importantly, we ensure that every project we fund gives employment to local people, 
of all levels of expertise and that it creates on the job training, allowing the people involved to grow and develop their skill set. To give you a few examples, in 2018, Alif offered support to the restoration of Raqqa Museum in northern Syria, a cooperation between a French NGO, La Guilde of Open Duaid, and local NGO, Roya, both working in close communication with the local council. The situation in Raqqa region presented many challenges. Security conditions have complicated the procurement of materials and prevented international experts from making visits. As a result, only local people were employed by the project, though external experts provided advice. This gave the project its resilience, and it, uh, it is on track despite COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, the work on the museum uh, stimulated the development of local technical skills and local economy. All materials were sourced locally and local traditional craftsmen were employed for special jobs such as woodwork um, on windows and brickwork. Um, another example of a project where local partnership contributed to project resilience and vice versa is the conservation of Tutunji House, an Ottoman building in Mosul. This project is a cooperation um, of Penn University, State Board and State Board of Antiquities and Heritage. The conservation was symbolic because this building has been renovated, had been renovated just before Daesh took over the city and then nearly destroyed during the Battle of Mosul. In practical terms, the building which belongs to the State, of Board, State Board of Antiquities and Heritage is designed to have a whole range of practical functions for the local experts and for inhabitants of Mosul. The renovation of Tutunji House has provided work for over 20 Iraqi workmen and specialists since 2019. This has again contributed to the reliance, uh, to the resilience of the project, um, which has, and the work hasn't stopped during the pandemic. In fact, the project is on track. Ali supports not only tangible, but also intangible heritage. Here, one example is a project we support with Turquoise Mountain in Afghanistan. The country's cultural practices have been weakened by the decades of conflict. The project supports local craftsmen helping in transmission of the craft, but also assisting them in entrepreneurial aspects and in tapping into global chains of demand. In other words, the preservation of local crafts, such as decorative tile making in Herat or carpet weaving in Bamiyan, is closely interwoven with securing economic op opportunities for craftsmen and craftswomen. One final aspect of Ali's work I will mention is our support to organizations in fragile countries during the pandemic. We are acutely aware that the pandemic posed severe threats to many cultural institutions, which operated on very tight budget to begin with. We also recognize that without these local institutions, preservation of global heritage is not possible. This is why Alif decided to offer small targeted support uh, at this critical time, and the grants were, as I mentioned, of up to $15,000. These grants ranged from support for PPE and work safety measures during the pandemic to computer equipment that enabled remote work. In some cases, we have also agreed to support salaries during the most critical time. I should stress, however, that we were very, very careful indeed to do so in a way that did not create the dependency. An important lesson from 2020 crisis is that we need to rebalance the heritage protection system and to move away from over-reliance on the expertise from the global north. We need to build back better and to do that, we need to contribute to local capacity and local resilience. And thank you, that's all from me and I very much look forward to discussing this during the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Dr. Maya Koninka. This is really a very important presentation showing how the solidarity is extremely important and support to the communities after the conflict and uh, uh, how building back better paradigm in this situation concerning recovery, post-trauma recovery uh, can be uh, in fact a tool of building resilience of societies and people, first and foremost. Uh, I would like to invite Mohammed to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Shadi Atukan. Thank you very much, Amra. 
So our third and last speaker for the first panel is Dr. Shadia Tukhan, the director of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. Dr. Tukhan is the director of the, world, of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. She's an architect and urban planner with extensive experience in the UK and the Middle East. She specialized in architectural preservation and revitalization of historic cities, in addition to development of cultural heritage policies, policies and restorations, restoration projects with UNESCO and other international organizations in Palestine and other Arab countries. For 20 years, she directed and implemented a comprehensive program for the revitalization of the old city of Jerusalem. Within her work with ARCWH and in view of the challenges facing world heritage properties in the Arab region, the center is focusing on post-conflict reconstruction of historic urban centers in the region. Dr. Shadia will uh, talk today about the heritage ownership and the role of younger generation in inspiring heritage recovery and communities empowerment. Dr. Shadia, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like uh, to also thank uh, my dear friend Amra for uh, uh, making this happen after long delays and to uh, continue to believe that we will um, finally uh, start Im implementing or uh, real first the webinar and we hope that things will improve and we can eventually um, have the very con construction in in person in Manama uh, but meanwhile we 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 cannot but persevere and continue the discussion and uh, um, benefit from the expertise of various, uh, participants with us today and uh, the authors in 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 the book that uh, Amra is is now uh, editing and preparing and I would like to um, start by um, focusing on something which is sometimes I'll try here to see if I can share the screen Uh, my, um, I would, how can I have this, the full page, Ya Muhammad? You have to uh, click in the bottom, on the right, there will be a full screen. It doesn't work. Doesn't work. Or click on F5. 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 Yes. Uh, no. Okay, now it's working. Now it's on the full screen. Yeah, okay. Shall I say approve Thank or something? You. No, no, it's fine. We see it in the full screen. Oh, uh, you can see it on the full yeah. Okay. Um, well, the, the title is Whose Heritage Is It Anyway? And I would like here to focus on um, um, important um, group that uh, we need to um, engage in the process of uh, protection of cultural and natural heritage, as well as to involve them in um, the, the reconstruction efforts and to in their assessment of the needs for um, environmental protection as well as heritage protection. Um, Youth for Inspiration, um, Few months before the issue of the pandemic broke um, broke up, and we started to hear all sorts of things. Before that, we were all, uh, our at least myself and a number of people I know, we were all fascinated by the passion and and uh, the reaction of uh, youth groups uh, to the environmental issues um, that uh, is facing um, the globe. Um, as a background, um, I will just mention a few things about the involvement of UNESCO with the youth and the culture of, uh, of the youth. And uh, just um, remind, um, remind us that since its establishment, UNESCO integrated youth as a cross-cutting component in all its programs and activities. 
recognizing the youth as a priority group that should participate in the relevant policies and plans, the World Heritage Center gave special attention to the inclusion of the young UNESCO in the UNESCO Operational Strategy for the Youth 2014 to 2021. UNESCO established, amongst other things, this is just a um, um, few of the issues that uh, UNESCO is involved in with regard to the youth, established the Youth Forum in 1999, meeting at the headquarters of UNESCO every two years to discuss challenges and urgent issues relevant to UNESCO's field of competence and responding to youth concerns. The World Heritage Center also holds the Youth Forum in conjunction with the yearly sessions of the World Heritage Committee. Um, just um, uh, images of the World Heritage Forum, which was held in Bahrain uh, in conjunction with um, the World Heritage Committee meeting 2018. Um, and you can see the involvement of a number of people from, from different countries. And it was a kind of practical as, as well as theoretical, as well as training on the process of uh, the World Heritage Committee and uh, how it works and, and uh, how uh, projects or, or sites are, are inscribed and nominated, what sort of problems, what, what sort of uh, issues they have to tackle. Going back to uh, the youth age statistics, 50% of the world population are under 30 years old, 42 are under 25 years old, and 26 are under 15 years old. So we have 50% of the world population. We need to ask what role does half of the world population have in the protection of its future heritage, uh, or future inheritance rather. Um, the thing is that um, the youth these days, if you do not engage them, if you do not involve them and build their capacity, um, they can always press a button and Google it, and they end up knowing more than we do. Um, if we look at the definitions we usually use in terms of the damage or the, the, the destruction of heritage, if we start by um, the damage to heritage due to conflicts and natural disasters and the consequences of the conflicts wars on heritage with all its severity and tragic impact on communities, this is not the only damage inflicted on historic monuments, buildings and urban landscape. Damage caused for decades, slowly but surely by urban expansion, one-sided investment and development at the expense of cultural and natural heritage. Damage is only part of systematic or arbitrary planning. As far as uh, the expression natural and man-made disasters is concerned, we can no longer distinguish between natural and man-made disasters as much of the increased environmental problems are consequences of actions taken by man. So we just have disasters. Uh, the challenges the, the young uh, are facing, and we were surprised to know how passionate they are and how seriously they are taking these issues. Um, statistics show that increasing interest among the youth under 20 in safeguarding their heritage, particularly concern about environmental issues, climate change, global warming, carbon emission, plastic accumulation in oceans, plastic oceans as is known. Um, the reaction was demonstrations, active protests in social media, unrest, school strikes all over the world, from Sweden to Switzerland, to New York, to London, to India, to China. The international coordination between protest movements and pressure groups, west to east, north to south, the youth, all over the world protested and um, rejected uh, the fact that this type of abuse to the environment should be acceptable, not only to them, but to the whole world. You know, they draw attention of the world that without us knowing how this whole thing happened, uh, that we have 50% of the population protesting about things that we have done. 
the youth are quite concerned and interested and serious and carry responsibility for safeguarding cultural and natural heritage. These are few images. I was trying to find some slides and there are hundreds, if not thousands. I thought this one shows, you know, um, a selection of uh, young men and women. In the old city of Jerusalem, youth were safeguarding cultural heritage, cleaning the stones from pollution, from graffiti. Uh, if we go back to the role of schools and academic institutions, um, I think at least in, in the Arab region and in many countries in the world, the heritage studies are not included in the curricula, neither at school or the undergraduate university levels in most countries, including architecture, engineering, um, archaeology. Um, this is something people notice and see and uh, the interest by educators is limited to annual site visits to museums, heritage sites, local historic sites, but not a systematic, clear academic uh, educational system that will make them aware and not have to Google to understand what's going on uh, or watch TV or, or uh, social media. Um, this is something that for, for quite some time we have been questioning and asking educators to include in, in, uh, in their studies and starting with schools and the younger the better. So the question is now, what legacy are we leaving for today's youth? From a positive side, a lot of guidance are included in volumes of regulations, charters, conventions, in various documents and publications to direct future generations on means and tools for protection of cultural and natural heritage. Such documents have been prepared, developed by international experts based on careful studies, research and consideration. And we all know the role of UNESCO and advisory bodies in producing these documents. On the negative side, while the young and future generation lost a lot of their cultural and natural rightful inheritance, they are left to deal with the aftermath of the natural man-made disasters and fight to save their world from environmental catastrophes and the loss of a major part of their cultural heritage. So where do you go from here? The objective of our webinar today, cultural heritage and people building resilience in superimposed traumas, is to contribute to the quest for the efficient, sound and sustainable solutions. While we are considering the consequences of the pandemic on our heritage and the impact on its already suffering communities, we cannot but ask ourselves, to whom are we protecting our heritage, the humanities heritage? What kind of humanity you are thinking of when we just write or say these words? From this dimension I chose today, I believe that not only we have an obligation to safeguard our cultural and natural heritage now, but we have also the obligation to include the youth and the young generation in all our efforts. And in that, I mean from policy making, from analysis of the problems, from attending conferences, from being involved in every um, um, activity that has to do with safeguarding for the future, because they are the future. UNESCO and the, is the UN Science, Education and Cultural Organization that embodies all what is needed to lead as it did since its inception in this important endeavor. Thus, I propose that advising, directing governments to include environmental and cultural studies in schools and undergraduates curriculum, this as a vital step to, that only UNESCO can take. It is important that we realize that with all our experience and expertise, uh, it is not us who are going to live with the consequences of what is happening, whether it is environmental problems or whether it is the destruction of historic cities and sites. It is the young and the youth who are going to rebuild and reconstruct Aleppo, rebuild and reconstruct Mosul, rebuild and reconstruct Sana'a. How can we distinguish between the, the, um, the horrors of war and conflict on 
buildings in Sana'a that go back to thousands maybe of years, at least hundreds of years, whether the, the, what's happening is related to so-called man-made conflict or destruction, uh, whether it is intentional or as um, a kind of collateral damage, or the floods that have uh, also um, caused the loss of a number of buildings there. Who's going to build Sana'a? It's not us. Who's going to al analyze what's the problem? How we can define it? How can we deal with the communities? Except the sons and daughters of that community. It is easy to theorize. It is easy to um, talk about the tools and the rules and the regulations and what we can and what we cannot reconstruct and all that. But I mean, it will be rebuilt and reconstructed or continue to be destroyed by the young and the youth. We can direct, we can guide, we can educate if possible. But at the end of the day, we have to rely on the 50% of the population and we cannot ignore them. Last year, just before the, the pandemic, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of of the youth went on school strikes. From Sweden, thousands in, in Madrid, in Geneva, quarter of a million in York, 100,000 in London, tens of thousands in India, more than that in, 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 in China. And um, all led by young people like the Swedish champion Greta and others. I read names of people who, who are dedicated, 15 years old, 17 years old, to fight the plastic ocean, to fight pollution, to fight um, building more railways, adding more uh, terminals. And now as we zoom from corners in our houses for a whole year, these airports and highways and malls and, and malls in airports and um, towers and high buildings, they're empty. What were they built for, except for benefit of developers, investors, and so on, and not thinking about how is this affecting the, the, the land? And what does it take from the future generations? So I consider that it is vital that we have the most important component that will safeguard our heritage for themselves and for the, the, the rest of the, the future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Shadia, for this extremely important presentation. I can say that you have just sent an essential and very strong message that has to be heard. It's timely to start working in a way that we understand that heritage is for the future of the half of the world's population. So you have raised a set of appealing issues and like set them in a framework that I understand will influence the final conclusions of the conference very much. And I hope that they will also be reflected in the future activities of both UNESCO and the uh, state parties, as well as the communities. Thank you very much. Now I would like to uh, inform you that we are starting with a question and answer session. <clears throat> and um, I would like to thank to the auditorium, to our colleagues that have been listening and raising questions. Uh, for now, we have received three questions. Uh, one question is coming from the uh, Jennifer. Um, let me see, Jennifer Cosell. 
sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name properly, Jennifer, uh, who, after um, a very important command, in fact, asked Mathilde, Dr. Mathilde Russler, what is the future of world? No, it was in fact the question, how does UNESCO actually incorporate communities in its decision on a practical level? How can this be improved? That is Jennifer's question. And in fact, uh, we have another uh, colleague from the auditorium who um, raised the same question to Matthew Russler, what is the future of World Heritage at Grassroots? So can I ask you, Dr. Matthew, to respond to these questions? Thank you very much, Amra, and I would like to thank uh, all the people watching and, and asking these questions. It's indeed a very, very important question because um, the relations to local communities and also to indigenous peoples has been a little bit rocky over the time of the World Heritage Convention because it is a legal instrument which is ratified by states parties. Now we have improved the, the system over time. So for example, since 1992, um, there was an inclusion um, that people need to be involved in the nomination. Um, that has been improved over time in the operational guidelines with different inclusions, um, meaning that uh, people from the state of preparing nominations um, that the state body has to include discussions with local communities and with all the stakeholders involved and uh, who may be affected by the listing of the World Heritage property. So that has been improved in general terms. What I think in terms of recovery and reconstruction uh, needs to be done is also that all the experts are aware. You know that it's not an expert decision, but as was done by Shadia and uh, the others this morning, we focused on people-centered approaches. Um, we cannot go on with um, reconstructions which are not based uh, on community feelings, especially uh, for the intentional destruction. Sometimes this is difficult. And this is why I mentioned the case of the Bamiyan Buddhas. We did not do the reconstruction. We did uh, from UNESCO side, uh, the stabilization of the Buddha niches. Um, we covered all the, um, and documented all the remains. But if you think about reconstruction and you will ask who is the community? Is it the people in the valley? Is it the Buddhists living elsewhere? Because these were Buddha statues. Uh, so, I mean, it really depends on the situation. And in the case of intentional destruction, you have also lots of people who fled the area because of conflicts and wars. And uh, where are they now, the original people who live there in and around the World Heritage Sites? So it is a very, very complex uh, question. Um, but I think um, my answer is um, that really we need to ensure that for any of the reconstruction communities are involved and uh, that we get uh, their inputs and that for any expert discussions, and this is why this seminar today is so important, uh, this is also in taken into account by the experts reviewing any proposals for recovery and reconstruction. Thank you, Amra. Thank you very much, Mathilde. Uh, the, um, uh, Jennifer said that the, uh, um, the other panelists also can reflect to this question, but we have a question from Dr. Hossam Mahdi, who uh, said how to secure the participation of local community in the absence of democracy and the strong policing of civil society by the state, particularly with regards to receiving foreign technical and financial support. And uh, this question is uh, to all three panelists. So if I may ask uh, Dr. Shadia and then Maya to answer to this question and then maybe Mattel would like to reflect to it as well. Uh, thank you very much, Amra. Um, I think um, the absence or uh, lack of democracy um, 
is something uh, that could be an obstacle, but I think there are always ways people can uh, express themselves without having a political kind of connotation of what they do. And that depends on the, um, the technical experts or the technical leaders on the ground who are, who are actually implementing projects. Because, well, some time ago, I, I worked in a place where it was really quite tough in terms of you have cameras everywhere and you shouldn't move here, shouldn't work. But at the end of the day, you can always um, consult with the, with the beneficiaries, ask the in, include the women who, who if you are uh, kind of renovating or restoring a house, um, talk to the those concerned. If you are uh, um, working on 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 a public building like a school, or you can these things have nothing to do. They don't. I mean, if they want, they can, of course. But you can as a technical. Uh, person and implementer, you can engage people without getting into the politics of it, and and they can they can watch. There was nothing to stop anybody doing what they're doing because of any political supervision, if you like. And um, and I think people appreciate that. And people, um, when you finish the project after you have discussed and agreed with them. Uh, what should be done and um, allow them, um, you know, the, the kind of freedom and flexibility to um, discuss with the builder or the contractor uh, details that they cannot understand. When it's finished, it is amazing. Uh, the, re the result is usually uh, far more uh, um, sustainable than we expected at the beginning because they have a sense of ownership that it is something that they they contributed to, this is their home or this is their school or whatever. And they make sure that their effort and your effort does not be, will not be wasted. But that was one of the most extreme cases of, if you like, political supervision and, and follow-up. But if you just um, limit yourself to the technical issues, um, I can't say that this is always successful, but I mean, I, I think in, if, if the, whoever is in charge feels threatened, of course they will stop you. And if, if, you, if you represent a political faction or whatever, I don't want to get into that because that was not the case um, that um, uh, I experienced. Just working with the community, uh, asking them what they need, uh, asking them their opinion every step in, in the way, um, training them, um, build their capacity. Many of them, their kids became um, plasterers or wanted to do, to do some traditional carpentry and so on and went to work and so on. But I mean, if they feel they own it because they are involved, I don't see, I may be mistaken, but it, we were working under for many years under very severe restrictions, but that did not stop the community being involved and being consulted and um, participate. I think, but I mean, maybe maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe there are other um, experiences that I don't know of. Thank you very much, Shadia. Um, Maya, do you want to comment on this, especially having in mind that? Uh, funding is the part of the question. Well, I, uh, so I agree that there is the biggest issue is not to take away the sense of ownership. Um, and the, and another, uh, the, another point, which is very important, is to uh, the sort of healthy dose of pragmatism. So focus on real practical questions of heritage preservation. Um, we, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting balance to catch. Of course, one uh, has to run the, the you know, we ask people we work with to run these projects, but in a, in a sense, they run them in response to the community needs. Of course, the technical aspects, this is guided by, by, by experts, but everything around it, uh, questions around, um, you know, how the space, uh, renovated space will be used, that is always consulted with the community and the technical technical um, response 
is a response to the needs identified by the community. Now, if, if perhaps one more point to make is that we can't aim for perfection. We work in areas where people are traumatized, where they have lost family members, they lost their homes. Um, their primary concern is um, to feed their family, to, to, to you know, rebuild their lives. Um, so we can't, sometimes there is, you know, the, the flip side of everything I, I said so far is that we also cannot force them to take all responsibility and to be involved on a daily basis in projects where they do not have economic stake, the practical stake, which is why we seek to employ them. Um, but the important part in all this is not to exclude them, to give them the, the option to participate. And I don't think that, I mean, of course, it is difficult in post-war areas where the civil society um, mechanism, if previously existed, have been severely eroded by conflict. But it is possible to build them back. And I think that this is a part, you know, the heritage is not always the building, it's everything around it. It's, it's reconstruction of the physical, but also of intangible that goes with it. So if we only reconstruct the building without integrating it with the life of the community, I'm not really sure that we're really reconstructing a heritage. Um, so I think that there is, it's a difficult balance to catch, but to respond to the question, I'm sorry, I rather drifted, but I think it is possible, um, as Shadia said, when we focus on practical, uh, you know, we, when, we, when we do not assert a place in the local community that really doesn't belong to us. So it's when we focus on the cultural heritage and its role for the community, I think we probably will see greater participation and no resistance from, uh, from local government. In fact, our experience has always been experience of support and close partnership from local, from local institutions. I'm not really sure if this answers the question, but I don't think but just to, t to say that I don't think there is one answer to this. I think yeah. that having a blanket answer is difficult. So it's really, I think fundamentally what we have to do is we have to listen and then we respond. And it has to be a very iterative process. Um, and it's not always easy, but it is possible. Thank you very much. And I believe that Dr. Hosna Mahdi, in fact, wanted to raise the issue to put it at the stage or to uh, shed the lights on it because it is one of the most appealing issues. So there is no simple answers, but there is a way to come to the solutions and to improve the situations that we have, situation that we have now. Uh, we have uh, one more question and um, the time is expiring. We, we will have to um, sort of stop very soon our first session and resume in uh, 1.30 with the wonderful presentations and the very, very frustrating and very traumatic cases from uh, Beirut, Uganda and uh, Yemen. Uh, I would like to use this opportunity to greet Dr. Munir Bushnyaki, who is today with us. Um, a former director general of ICROM and the former director of uh, Arab Regional Center for World Heritage, uh, who is also one of the authors of the chapters in our book that will be published next year and speaker at the conference. And uh, hopefully uh, one of the speakers at the uh, one of the future webinars. So uh, to thank him for the support and nice words that he sent to uh, all the panelists. Uh, uh, also, Dr. Zaki Aslan is today with us and uh, a good news that Dr. Zaki Aslan can share with us is that uh, Ikram Sharja, uh, together with the uh, delegation of Poland to UNESCO uh, translated uh, a Warsaw document uh, into the Arabic. So uh, the Warsaw recommendation is now approachable in Arabic language uh, for the whole region. So the last question, and I would like to ask you just to reflect to it as short as possible, is from uh, Francis, who is coming from, who is listening to us from Kenya. Uh, 
who in fact said, yeah, well, with the World Heritage Sites, it is a better situation than with the thousands of other non-recognized heritage sites around the world. So is there any, some kind of a suggestion what to do or do you have something as a policies concerning this heritage that has not been recognized as a world heritage? So, uh, Dr. Shadia, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. yeah, I can partially answer uh, if possible, because there are many other ways to protect sites locally um, by um, having um, a local uh, kind of list of uh, uh, heritage, heritage site. It doesn't have to be um, recognized, but I think it's something to do with an inventory the um, state party should be doing to all its um, sites or what they consider to be something they that repre represents an important part of their history, an important part of their heritage. It doesn't have to, to go or be, be uh, accepted uh, if nominated or not and inscribed but there should be always a local list that state parties um, will either um, survey or, or know about sites that are very important to them and will be on a, on a local, on a local uh, protection list. Uh, also, uh, some of them could, could be added to the tentative list, which could be inscribed or not. So the, the, the World Heritage Site itself, some people think it's, it's kind of uh, restraining uh, once it is inscribed, it's more, it puts more restraint on, on it and on its surroundings. And uh, the state parties lose kind of uh, sovereignty over it. But I mean, the local, the local list, uh, it's probably something that uh, should have the same um, rules and conditions for its protection by the state party. But I mean, what, what, you, what you think is an important site, it has to be verified by experts to say, yes, this is quite important for our um, country, for our nation, for our future generations. So it's the state party's responsibility, I guess. Thank you very much, Dr. Shania. And we have three minutes uh, before ending this first session. Uh, we had one question by uh, Dr. Munir Bushnyaki to Maya Kominka. Uh, how are you defining and calling the community or communities to be partners in the construction or restoration of damaged sites? Uh, Dr. Kominka has already written her answer, but if you can just summarize in one but minute. It's a fantastic question. And I wish I had um, a very good answer. A, it, I, I would say it's, it's, a work, it's work in progress because effectively a community is a group of people and very often community doesn't really agree within itself who is and who is not a part of community and who can speak on behalf of the community, which makes it of course very difficult. But what we are trying to do we're trying to, to make sure that we speak with local, that our projects speak with local people in the diversity. That is, that there is no, that if, if possible, we include all voices, young and old and male and female, rather than only voices that are traditionally um, uh, speaking for the community. Uh, because if we are to build back better, we really have to, we have to be more equitable rather than amplify the traditional inequities that often go with cultural heritage protection and a lot, not only. Um, so it is, it is very difficult, uh, but again, I think this is, this is something which um, is work in progress and where we have to persist and not aim for perfection, but be as inclusive as possible. I don't know if this answers the question. Yeah, of course, it is one of the answers and it's uh, great. Thank you very much. I would like now to thank to all those who were present during the, these, the, the first panel, the first session. 
and uh, I would like to uh, suggest to stop here with the first session and to resume our panel uh, at 1.30 Central European time. So um, the next panel will, will be um, about the case studies dealing with this uh, superimposed trauma in the most vulnerable heritage sites. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you to all speakers. Um, we have some more questions and I would like to promise to all uh, people who are asking questions that we will try uh, to provide answers either during the panel in the afternoon during the uh, question and answer session or um, via email or another way. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you at 1.30 Central you. European time. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.
Hello? Yeah? Hi, how are you? Hi. I can't hear you very well, actually. Um, yeah, I know. I'm trying to fix the problem, but I'll just speak louder like this. Okay. If you can also maybe um, be closer to the microphone. Yes, I will do that once I start talking. Thank you. I'll be right back.
Uh, Amra, I think we can resume now. Hello. We are now starting our second session in the panel. And the title of the second session is Cultural Heritage and People in the Maze of Intermittent Disasters. While COVID-19 is a global challenge, its effects are the most distressing in the communities which are trying to come to terms with the consequences of the past disasters. Cultural heritage is never untouched by the suffering-posed distress, and its condition portrays the trauma of the community. A number of the reconstruction and recovery project, projects of the heritage sites take place in between intermittent disasters of, with the same or similar triggers or origins and under the long lasting condition of cumulative tasks. These are the places where a continuous first aid activity stands for recovery. The new occurrences of devastating disasters while the recovery from a previous trauma is going on have affected a number of communities and their heritage. Speakers at this session will explain the complexity of the uh, either intermittent trauma caused by fire, for example, in uh, fire and refire in Kasubi Tombs in their cases, or the impact of and its impact to heritage, as well as impact of the heritage destruction to both local people and the nation of the world. The uh, speakers, the Professor Huveida El Harithi and Samira El Shavesh, will explain uh, the cumulative effect of different trauma that are appearing, as well as uh, the intermittent nature of the disasters, such as flood, that uh, endangers uh, cultural heritage in Yemen, for example. So I would like to ask my colleague, uh, Mohammed Zian Buzian to introduce the first speaker at the second panel, uh, Professor Hoveida El Harithi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amra. So I have the pleasure to welcome you back to this second panel uh, discussion of our webinar today. And uh, without any delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker to the second panel, Dr. Hawaid Al Harithi, who will, as mentioned by uh, our colleague Amra, present the case of the work of planning the recovery of the neighborhood impacted by the blast that occurred in last August in Beirut using people centered <coughs> heritage led strategic framework of recovery within the uh, Beirut lab or Beirut Urban Lab at the American University of Beirut. Dr. Huwaid Al Harithi is <coughs> Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at the Department of Architecture and Design at the American University of Beirut. <coughs> she was a visiting professor at Harvard University, MIT, and Georgetown University. Her research focuses on urban heritage and contemporary interventions in historic cities. She's widely published with over 50 articles, book chapters, and reports. <coughs> in leading journals and refereed books. Our current research conceptualizes urban recovery in relation to processes of historical editing, urban trauma, and, pro and protracted displacement. Her research is advanced through her role as co-director of the Beirut Urban Lab. Please, Dr. Huayda, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Amra, and all the organizers for including me in this fantastic um, uh, presentation sequence from many colleagues and dear scholars. Um, I have 10 minutes, so I will go straight to my presentation. I'm presenting a case that I'm uh, currently working on. It's not a finished case, but um, the grounding for it is well set from uh, our previous research. So I will try to frame it, but it's work in progress 
and uh, may, may not have a definite conclusion. I want to walk you through the um, last event suffered in Beirut, which is the port explosion of August 4th, and how the Beirut Urban Lab mobilized to assist and um, uh, work with people on the ground on a participatory recovery. So the blast, for those who don't know, took place on August 4th at 6.07, and it was the largest uh, non-nuclear blast uh, that has recorded. And of course, it impacted the downtown because the port is just adjacent to the downtown area and many, many of the adjacent neighborhoods. We in the, urban, uh, in the Beirut Urban Lab, which was established two years ago, along with colleagues such as Mona Harib, Mona Fawaz, and Ahmed Garbiya, um, mobilized and kind of dropped all the projects we are doing to um, re-engage in the post-blast uh, affairs in Beirut. We, of course, have accumulated a lot of experience in post-war and post-disaster recovery due to our location in Beirut and the sad uh, and unfortunate situation in the region. So we have a lot of research and projects devoted to post-war Beirut, post-2006 um, uh, reconstruction in Dahi suburb of Beirut and in the south, where we volunteered through the reconstruction unit. We also have a lot of work in Syria and Iraq at the moment. Part of the lab agenda is a post-disaster and post-war recovery track, which I lead. So I'm going to um, work from that. Once the blast took place, we mobilized in th three independent tracks. Uh, we, of course, fundraises through a grant to help us devote our time. We are four directors and about 16 researchers. So we set an agenda of three tracks. One is the observatory in which all the data is made available to all actors who are engaged in the post-blast recovery, but also uh, collecting data further to build profiles of all the neighborhoods impacted and to do stakeholders analysis uh, and a, establish a reservoir of material needed for all decision-making processes. The second track was uh, interventions at the neighborhood scale, and this is where I'm mostly involved. And our pilot is in the quarantina that you will see today. The third is citywide a visioning exercise we do with international actors and academics who volunteer to partner with us, which talks about the city in general and uh, how to best approach this um, from a higher level rather than from a smaller scale neighborhood intervention. I will focus mostly on the neighborhoods that are around downtown Beirut that are heavily invested with heritage. Jamaizi, Marim Khail, Jaitawi, many of these areas were conceived as the areas that were spared with the post-war recovery of Solidaire in downtown, which was more of a tapula rasa approach to the reconstruction of downtown. These are the peripheral, peripheral neighborhoods that were spared that kind of development and were heavily invested with heritage um, and were sort of becoming very important sites of new, younger population, artists, um, and so on. These were the areas that were hit. And of course, you can imagine the devastation, not only in terms of human life, but also lo loss of heritage. The um, catastrophe caused 200 people to die, over 6,000 people were injured, and 300,000 people were displaced. In our research, we are really concerned with patterns of displacement. So the um, any recovery plan takes on this um, as a major factor. Um, I will focus on Carantina as an, as an example, because um, Carantina is the most vulnerable of the neighborhoods. It lies only 600 meters of the epicenter where the explosion happened. So it was totally devastated. But here again, to go back to the notes you have been mentioning about you know, accumulation of trauma, 
this site has been subjected to multiple traumas already. And even before the blast, it has suffered many vulnerabilities. To give you a little bit of historic background, Carantina takes its, uh, its name from quarantine. It was established in the 19th century by the Ottomans as a quarantine. Um, then, of course, the city grew around it and it became a site of refuge. It received the Armenian refugees um, in 1918. It received um, Palestinian refugees after the Nakba. And then the uh, late last wave of refugees was the Syrian refugees after 2011. So you can imagine this is a site charged with um, important events. Uh, it suffered a great deal during the civil war and it was a site of massacres. So there's a number of um, traumas that were suffered, but also an, an interesting and colorful mixity of people, Lebanese, um, refugees, migrant workers. Of course, it's the only um, uh, low income a residential neighborhood around downtown proper. So this was very important for us to consider. And that's why we decided to move into Carantina first, because it is the most vulnerable and most impacted. Many people don't consider that Carantina as a site that was industrial around the port, that it contains a lot of the heritage that you find in other neighborhoods. But for me, heritage is a social construct. Heritage is both the historic, the tangible, and the intangible. It's how people uh, construct their view of their own past and what they choose to continue from it. Um, so um, I treat heritage as a much more open um, construct that is not only about the historic and what is uh, registered as uh, landmarks. So from that perspective, I still talk about a people-centered heritage-led Although Carantina has a very interesting uh, historical narrative and very interesting uh, building types that for me um, still are considered heritage. But it's very important to note that the damage there was super extensive. The problem is that people could not fix their houses like you saw in other neighborhoods. They are very, very poor or old tenants on old rent. That's rent control. They cannot fix the, these houses to return to them. So we faced a major problem with displacement and people departing. So um, we had to operate within our own conviction that we're not working with reconstruction, but rather urban recovery, which is conceived as an open-ended process triggered by any act of rupture. And that uh, for recovery to take place, it has to be uh, about the social, the spatial, the cultural, and the economic, just as much as it is about the physical. So uh, the other position that we take is that it's not a post condition. We don't want to return and restore what was there, but we often try to outline and identify the vulnerabilities that existed before the blast or the trauma so that the urban recovery takes into account any injustices and vulnerabilities that existed before. So for us, it's a process that is beyond just reconstructing or rebuilding as it was. Our approach uh, from that position is that we are always advocating and working within a holistic urban recovery framework that is social, cultural, economic, and spatial, one that is people-centered, participatory, socially just, and heritage-led. So um, when we work, we unfold the process with the community from day one uh, and with all the actors on the ground. So from August 5th, we were on the ground observing, uh, understanding who are the actors, identifying them, coordinating with them, and building partnerships with those who are interested in long-term recovery. Of course, a lot of the actors, 90% of the actors we met were humanitarian and emergency relief people who are concerned with medical care of those injured, food distribution, and small repairs. So of course, we understand what they do, but we really try to build uh, partnerships with those interested in long-term. Our second uh, methodology is to connect with the community there. And of course, we identify community entry points. We build trust 
uh, we understand that you cannot immediately come to a community and work with it. This is a process that needs to unfold and you build a relationship and you build trust. Um, and we engage these community members in conversations in uh, site tours in actual interventions. So we have three clear steps to our community engagement process that begins by actually recruiting and training citizen scientists. Those are local researchers from the area who we train in research methods and they begin to collect data with us that um, understand the conversations and they continue to build capacities to become our partners when we co-design with the community the recovery framework. We also conduct workshops and these workshops with a, a wider community, not just the citizen scientists, to attempt with them to extract and craft a vision because you have to design a vision uh, to articulate a vision before you design a recovery framework that's long term. Our third strategy is to uh, do a strategic intervention with the community, design a community space that becomes our meeting ground that is an extension of their, their socio-spatial practices uh, where they gather, where they meet. Of course, in Carantina, we realize soon after being there that there are multiple communities, like you were asking before, who is that community? So these multiple communities um, kind of live a little bit in isolation. So we created three different interventions and one comment to all of them so that they can come uh, into a reconciliatory conversation together. Uh, parallel with all of this, of course, we do the scientific experts led project, which is collecting the data, analyzing the neighborhood through planning, through socio-spatial narratives and practices, through a historical um, understanding of its um, urban dynamics and trends over time. And we do that through desktop research, interviews with residents, owners, and actors as well, as well as co collecting mental maps and oral histories. So we really fully capture not only what the facts are, but how the area is conceived and perceived by its own people. And if there are pl plural realities that exist, we need to also capture that in order to move forward. We um, talk to individual people, residential uh, uh, inhabitants, business owners. We understand, for example, if they intend to stay or were forced to leave and what would bring them back. The businesses here are very interesting um, profile because they're all tied to the port and they don't want to leave despite the destruction. They repair whatever little that keeps them there because their work is tied strongly to the port and any relocation would jeopardize the businesses altogether. So again, back to this notion of displacement that we need to protect when we recover any site. The data collection reveals a very, very important narratives uh, by different age groups, by, by, by gender. Our citizen scientists, for example, are balanced. They, we have Syrians, Armenians, who are the old residents, Christians, Muslims, men, women, young, old. Uh, we try to get uh, around all the different people who can uh, narrate the site for us and also envision how it should be recovered um, in the project that we are designing or co-designing with them. Uh, just to not to take up too much time, um, all of that brings us uh, through the research and the engagement with the community to extract the main challenges, because again, this is a strategic urban recovery framework. It's not a master plan. We think master plans are not really the best tool to advance a participatory urban recovery, especially in the absence of the state in Lebanon. Uh, we, we rather work with an urban recovery framework that is based on a vision extracted by the community, co-designed by them. So we create action plans that are incre incrementally implemented and matched with donors, the total sum of which would add up to the recovery framework against issues that are dominant. For example, here, the displacement is a very important issue because you have evictions, you have people whose houses are damaged, but they have no income to repair them and they're forced to move elsewhere. And then the owners find this as an opportunity to reclaim 
the buildings and maybe develop new. So this opens the door for development. Um, developers are like vultures here because the real estate and of the financialization of land. Um, Carantina is by the sea. It's in close proximity to the city center. So it's a very uh, opportune uh, site for development, large scale. A high end development, which is threatening for the low income community that exists here. There is also a third issue that we found out, which is the military presence on the site in this neighborhood. There has been a militarization of privately owned sites during the uh, civil war, and this has been um, ongoing and there was uh, no change in that status. We also found a fourth and very important track to investigate, which is the tension that exists between groups. Because this is a multiple sites of trauma, the communities that exist have sectarian tension that goes back to the civil war. And uh, we have to really be careful how to engage all of them equally, but also engage them in a conversation that would be reconciliatory, that would open up the prospects of uh, them coming together within one recovery project. So this is where we are today. We have finished the data collection and in, in engaging the community. We've trained the citizen scientists. Now we are entering a phase where we'll co-design the um, urban recovery framework that is bottom up, but we engage all actors who may be important for decision making. Uh, but also for funding opportunities for these small projects. We are partners with UNDP on this project for over a year. So we also build partnerships as we move forward. And um, I hope that you will hear next time uh, in more um, details. And I hope there are successful details when the project unfolds and takes place. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor El Harithi. This is, in fact, a wonderful example of this people-centered approach and uh, all the questions concerning how to address the community, how to attend the needs of the community are, uh, in fact, the answers to them are offered through your wonderful presentation. And I'm very much looking forward to the result. Thank you. And I hope that uh, maybe at uh, our conference, you will be able to present some of the results. So. Thank you so much. I would like uh, to ask uh, my colleague Mohammed to uh, introduce our next speaker, Jonathan Agnes Buka. Thank you, Amara. Uh, so our next speaker is Mr. Jonathan Edward Nsubuga, who will be uh, who will be presenting the case of the Kasubi Tombs World Heritage Sites in Uganda, one of the World Heritage properties inscribed on the list of World Heritage in Danger due to ravaging fires that occurred in the site, burning some of the attributes conveying its outstanding universal value. So Mr. Jonathan Edward Nsubuga is an Ugandan architect and the founder and principal of GA Nsubuga and Associates based in Kampala in Uganda. He was trained by and worked for the architects Stephen Gage, Will Aretz, Wim van der Berg, Mike Gold, and Zaha Hadid in London. Beside the architectural, the architectural practice, which includes design of social, commercial, and residential building, he has worked on cultural heritage conservation and is currently the architect in charge of the reconstruction of the Kasubi Royal Tombs. Is also involved in reviewing the Global Case Studies project on reconstruction with Ecomas International. Please join me to welcome Mr. Nsubuga. Mr. Nsubuga, you have the floor, please. Jonathan, do you hear us? Uh, you should share. Jonathan's presentation. Okay. Hello. I ask cancer. Yes. You you Hello. hear us, Jonathan? Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, um, we have the recording of the presentation of Jonathan. So. It will be it will be run from our side. 
Okay, let's go. Thank you very much. There's no audio there. We've witnessed an increase of... I thank the director of the Arab Regional Center for the World Heritage Dr. Shadia Tulkan and the team behind this important webinar for inviting me to present the case study. We have witnessed an increase of heritage sites being destroyed by conflict and disasters such as fires. My particular case, the Kasubi tombs, was gutted by fire in March 2010 and has so far taken 10 years to attain some tangible progress in the construction. Many other factors have influenced this process. The title of my presentation is Time Travel in Heritage Construction. Affect the, the Kasubi tomb site is set within an urban fabric. Situated on one of Kampala's crawling hills, the site has shrunk significantly in the last 135 years and now covers only 64 acres. Only essential structures that affect the daily cultural and spiritual events exist. These are what form the ensemble of structures of which are essentially vessels transmitting the spiritual content from the past, present and afterlife. The Kasumi tombs were inscribed in 2001 under criteria one, three, four, and six. These inscriptions apply to both the principal house in the ensemble called Muziba Zalampanga and also to the broader context of the site. As a living site, the most powerful aspect is that of intangible heritage, which has influenced the reconstruction, construction and management policies. Decisions have been taken using all inscription and OUV of the site as guiding principles. Also the delay in the commencement of this construction has been um, attributed to verification of these um, criteria. There have been two major fires within a period of 10 years. The main structure that was gutted in 2010 was the jewel of the ensemble. The impact of this fire was felt by a wide range of stakeholders. The traumatic event served to galvanize the significance of the site. To proceed with the recovery, a series of rituals were undertaken. New structures were constructed to house and protect the spiritual values of the site by housing the twins, the Abalongo. One of these houses was later gutted in 2020 during the lockdown um, of the COVID pandemic. Within the recovery and reconstruction period in the last 10 years, inscription three has been critical in protecting the intangible aspects. It is clear during the post-traumatic phase that the destroyed structures are essentially vessels whose contents are the guardians of the traditions of this site. Each king, prince, princess buried at the Kasubi tombs has a twin, a double, who remains on earth after their demise. This twin is dressed over many years from the umbilical cord. These twins have custodians and have their own houses. They are brought out in the open during specific rituals and ceremonies. As reference points, they are sacred. The 2020 fire gutted one of the principal twin houses, adding more to the intrigue and the trauma within the community.
Okay, that was all the recording that we had from um, from Mr. Nsubuga uh, presentation. I don't know if he can hear us or can intervene at this point. Yeah. Can you? Can yeah, I, can, I can hear you. Okay. Can I can you hear you? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. 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 yes now I'm we can. Sorry about that. Yeah. No problem. So I can maybe take over at this point. Yes. Yes. Please uh, go yeah, ahead. The risk. Yeah. The risk management of the site. Um, we have number one, which is the authenticity and the reconstruction process. Many challenges to the recovery process on this project um, has been the authenticity of the events and the people involved in making decisions. Number two, the heritage ownership. Um, all members of the Baganda tribe are stakeholders and this creates past struggles and a need to safeguard the norms and traditions. Social aspects have been strained due to the authenticity at all levels. Um, concepts of the intangible and intangible are transmitted from one generation to the, to the next through the rotation of the hereditary king's wives who maintain the physical aspect and spiritual elements that inhabit the spaces and the houses. Capacity building has been critical in bringing in the lower, the younger generations um, into the ownership of what's going on on the project on the site. Number three, um, the cleansing and the rituals. The social, cultural and ritual practices associated with the site are part of the continuation of the heritage value. Um, number four, social and economic challenges. Effects of the trauma have been considerable um, and emergency works and repairs have been executed when needed. Delay in the commencement of the construction enhance the trauma within the community. The traumatic events have galvanized the importance of the site to all and especially the younger generation. Number five, the political influence. A national technical committee was set up to coordinate the reconstruction activities. Guiding principles of the recovery have been based on the World Heritage Inscription. This has, this has been periodically created tension in the management of the reconstruction process within the community as well. Number six, spiritual guidance. The introduction of the spiritual realm within the post-traumatic period was critical in verification of actions taken and in carrying out rituals associated with the reconstruction process. This has enabled the cross-pollination of past activities and corrective measures whilst dealing with the recovery process. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, these images um, indicate one of the problems. The top three images in the, um, are showing you the training undertaken by the artisans and the police on the site in case a fire um, came and destroyed the work being undertaken um, currently. Unfortunately, the two bottom pictures show you that even the um, risk, disaster risk management attempts that were taken, they did not work during the actual fire in 2020. Um, this also created a lot of um, angst within the community due to the COVID 2020 um, pandemic, where we had a lockdown and all the workers had to stay on site for over three months. And that somehow helped put the fire out because there were people staying on the site. Next, please. Yes, yeah, so the conclusions and challenges um, from my experience in the last 10 years, there's been and we need more cohesion between the wives of the kings. These are hereditary wives, uh, people who inherit the, inherit the titles, and they've been fighting amongst themselves. Um, secondly, the twins um, and the Balongo house challenges to be resolved through the spiritual intervention and cha channels and other stakeholders. And number three, we need to redesign the firefighting responses that we, we had kind of, we, we, where we got approval from um, Ecomos previously because during the fire of 2020, we realized that they were not going to work. And number four, which is last, is um, the issue of connecting of the past with the present. Nothing can be done correctly without re reference to the ancestors um, on, on the site. We we'll have to sit down and ask them questions on what we need to do to correct um, the problems and also dealing with the spiritual um, aspect of the, of, the, of the reconstruction and recovery of heritage. Next one, please. So I just I'm included the three photographs that show you details of where we are now um, with regards to the 
reconstruction and the recovery of the heritage. I kind of coined up this phrase, I dream of tomorrow for a better yesterday today, because that's what we are, we've been doing. We're looking, yes, we were looking at the past to create and get solutions for what we're trying to do to have an authentic, authenticated um, structure that contains all the spiritual uh, gratification for the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Wonderful sentence, uh, amazing message, and very poignant example of a cumulative effects of superimposed trauma. So how COVID-19 um, situation affected World Heritage Site and how this uh, disaster, free fire, occurred at the site that has already suffered fire once. So um, it is extremely important case to um, raise the issues and learn the lessons. I would like now to invite uh, Mohammed to introduce our third speaker and the last one in this session, Professor Samira al -Shalash. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amra. So I just take this opportunity to remind our participant to not hesitate. The, um, the question and answer chat, chat box to uh, ask their questions for the following session. Our following and last speaker for today is Dr. Samira al shawish from Yemen, who will be talking about one of the iconic World Heritage properties in the Arab region, the city of Dr. Samira al shawish is an associate professor, a professor in architecture and environmental control in the Department of Architecture at the Faculty of Engineering in Sana'a University, Yemen. She published a number of studies and papers on cultural heritage, she was involved in the preparation of the curriculum for architectural and urban conservation at the Yemeni universities in cooperation with the Ministry of Higher Education, Ikram Sharjah, and the Social Fund for Development in Yemen. She participates in many activities related to heritage with her students and local communities. Her presentation today is entitled People, People and Heritage in Yemen, Where To? Please, Dr. Samira, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Could you please put my uh, presentation on the screen? Yes. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the Arab Region Center for World Heritage in Bahrain for the invitation and to all the members of the team who worked to accomplish this great webinar. My presentation today will be about people and heritage in Yemen, where to? Next, please. Here you will find examples for our unique Yemeni heritage, which varies from city to city and from site to site. Next. No, we have one before this, please. Yes. No, no, sorry. Yes, this one, please. All these appear because people were living with dignity and safety, even the most of them not rich. They used to take care of everything using their knowledge and culture that full of beauty, colors, poetry, music, and handicrafts to create their history. Next, please. With this beauty and love, they created their unique architecture and cultural heritage, which you see here as an example. Next, please.
Here, Yemeni people have started to suffer from poverty, hunger, diseases, and lack of services when the situation changed and become what it is now. Next, please. Heritage is also suffering from neglect, destruction, and distortion, being alone in facing all this. Facades are not longer beautiful and decorated in white. The green color disappeared from the gardens. Urban fabric of the city was destroyed by strange elements. Historical and all cities had been swallowed by chaos, treating their survival and history. Next, please. Due to the suffering of people, heritage also suffering. Next, please. In this slide, you can configure that we have three locations in, uh, that were registered on the list of World Heritage. And also we have one in Natural Heritage, which is Sukatra Island. In these three cities, Shibam Hadramaut, uh, Old Sana'a city, and Zabid, the population on those cities in Shibam, 3,000, in Old City, 80,000, and in Zabid, 48,000. The poverty level in Shibam, 50%, and it's equal in Sana'a and Zabid, which is between 80 and 90%. All these cities are now on the list of world heritage in danger. Next, please. Uh, people suffer from several reasons, but the most important are war and armed conflict, which affected all aspects of social, economic, health, safety, environment, etc. Missiles and bombing have destroyed valuable and authentic, authentic parts of our heritage, also fighting and killing have climbed the lives. Next, please. Even nature wants to participate in the song of people and the heritage, so it sent them rain and floods. Next, please. Despite the speed of COVID-19 in Yemen, people do not have the luxury of being afraid of it and did not pay attention to it. They know the fact of the health system of their country. What affected them in the corona pandemic was the lockdown measures, closure of schools, markets, public life, lack of basic service, all of that affected their livelihood and daily work. So they lost their small jobs and those increased poverty and increased their suffering. Next, please. In this slide, we will review the most important issues that people face in historical cities. War, armed conflict, the absence of authority and its role, acute shortage of basic services, increasing number of residents, and the need to increase spaces and add parts to their buildings, poverty and the impact of COVID-19, social relationships, and the disappearance of norms that allowed them to use the neighbor's wall to expand and upon. Participation in public spaces, but now there are those who have the money and the power to build in public spaces. Aris disputes, which leads to the neglect of houses until they are destroyed and sold. The high cost of restoration and maintenance for historic buildings and correspondingly cheap modern materi materials. 
preservation law and its inflexibility to accommodate people needs, requirements and urbanization needs. The delay in obtaining the license from GOFSI, months pass, but nothing new. In all city in Sana'a, where its market dominate on the stock exchange, gold and textiles, and become a place for large merchants and a place for all kinds of imported trade, merchants are controlling and show their needs for spaces and buildings. Also the impact of street uh, fenders and the role of the owners of the small shops who contribute to destruction of the city and its commercial activities and the nature of its traditional markets. Next, please. Next, please. So how can we help people in historical cities? First of all, we, ha we have to raise, raising awareness of importance of heritage. Next, please. Conducting interactive activities and announcing grants for best neighborhoods, buildings, or activity. Provide the traditional materials used in adding construction or restoration at affordable and subsidized prices. Activating domestic tourism. Encouraging the existence of community association concerned with the problems of people and seeking to solving them. Next, please. Establishing a court or local council for discussing disputes between owners and heirs and resolving them in cases of filler to reach solution. They are both for the benefit of GOFSI and they can use, reuse it them as appropriate. Next, please. Improving the economic situation and creating job from home. Next. Support and encourage handicrafts, industries, and traditional trade, and forbidden foreign or untraditional products. Revising the conservation law to make it more flexible and to consider the requirements of people and urbanization. Establishing partnerships with Yemeni universities to benefits of the staff and students, the power of youth in volunteer work and advocacy for historic cities. Sign agreement with the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Higher Education to commit to field visit to historic cities and to participate in their various activities. Next, please. Finally, I want to thank you and thanks are extended to all the staffs in Gofsi, in Sana'a, Zabid, and Shibam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Samira, for this very poignant presentation. And uh, it's very hard to find the words to react to such a complicated situation in a, such a wonderful part of the world. Uh, so much affected heritage that belongs to all of us. Uh, the beauty that we can see and the importance of that heritage in fact obliges the world to not only to express the solidarity, but to be responsible towards that heritage. I uh, would like now to uh, start the session with the questions and answers. We have two commands, not the questions that we have received uh, from Francis, who is in fact um, asking Jonathan uh, to explain that the places like Kasubi Toms, if I properly understand this command, are the places where there was some kind of the 
uh, uh, plurality expressed through their function and that uh, respect towards the uh, Muslim sacred uh, tradition was expressed at those places. And he asks um, where the first Quran holy book was found uh, that the uh, Prophet Muhammad was honored at the site and that the people from the uh, Mid East should also consider this place important and he suggests erecting an obelisk or some kind of a monument uh, because it belongs to the history of the whole world. But being at the least of the world heritage the very fact that it is World Heritage Site confirms its outstanding and universal values. And I'm, I, I would like to, um, to say that, in fact, the case of Kasubi Tombs was the first case through which I learned about this wonderful intangible heritage expressed through construction while reading the Jonathan's case study that was prepared for the e-commerce and also while listening to his presentations of all these traditions, that was also some kind of a lesson to him as an um, uh, academically educated architect who has not known his own tradition before starting the reconstruction of Kasubi Tom. Then we have the other comment uh, by our dear colleague, Joe King, and I'm uh, so happy to greet uh, Joe. Uh, and to thank him to being with us. He said, not a question, but a command. Both the first case studies are excellent examples of working with people in different ways. In the Beirut case, it is multiple communities and there was a need uh, to ensure that all were are included. In the Uganda case, it is a great example of the need to link the intangible uh, with the reconstruction. Uh, we have here, but I cannot, the um, question and comment of uh, Professor Leila Karaitza from uh, Bahrain University. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoveida, for presenting the case of Beirut after the explosion. It is really great how you are involving the community and offering them very much needed hope for a better future. Downtown Beirut was led by Solidaire. Considering current political and economic situation in Lebanon, what do you think would be the scenario in the case of Quarantina and other neighborhoods around Beirut port? And if I can uh, add to this wonderful and extremely important question that was raised by my dear colleague and friend Leila Karaitza, who is uh, also Bosnian, linked with Bahrain, <laughs> living in Bahrain. Uh, um, I would like to uh, ask you, while answering to this question, Professor El Harisi, to tell us how the lessons learned through the post-war reconstruction of Beirut can be drawn in post-blast reconstruction of Beirut. I know that you have been writing a lot about this uh, vulture nature of development. So uh, have the Beirut community and the Beirut authorities and all the stakeholders learned something that can be a concern concerning the future steps in the reconstruction? Thank you very much, uh, both Leila and Amra for these questions. I'll try to explain a little bit because the situation in Lebanon is quite complex. The state uh, was absent in the post-war recovery and it um, gave it away to a private company, private development company called Solidaire um, and rendered the role of the government even at the monitoring level to be totally um, nulled. So a private company set in motion a, the um, acquisition of land, the demolition of all building and the tapula rasa approach it adopted. Many people were against it and um, mobilized. 
but uh, it was just immediately after the war. It was launched in actually in the middle of the war and then in 91 and then Solidaire was established in 94 to start the work. Many buildings were being demolished along the process to pave the way for this option. Um, the um, situation now is um, um, very, very different, but uh, since then the state has not changed attitude. We have seen the state kind of absenting itself through the post-war reconstruction. Uh, it limited all of the post-war reconstruction to downtown Beirut. All other areas had no strategic approach or plans for recovery from the war, the civil war. After 2006, the state also absented itself after the Israeli attacks on many villages in the south and the southern suburbs of Beirut, the state limited its role to funding, channeling funding to people in the form of compensation that was problematic even as a formula. Uh, with the Syrian refugees, the state also absented itself and had no strategic approach to hosting Syrian refugees. We had uh, over a million Syrian refugees. We have um, the most number of refugees in cap per capita in the world. The state also um, uh, stopped by saying we will not allow camps, you know, because of the Palestinian experience. So now we don't expect the state to have a role either. And the state um, now is in um, a major uh, struggle with corruption and it's being dismantled with demonstrations since October. People have no faith in the political elite. Uh, so we don't see a role for the state um, in the recovery projects in after the blast. Um, not even to channel funds because all international donors and countries insist not to channel any funds through the state. So as actors on the ground who don't want to go to a republic of NGOs either. We believe the NGOs have done a fabulous job in emergency aid and uh, humanitarian aid, but this should not be rendered, you know, um, as a, uh, a process that is run by NGOs. Um, local municipalities have very limited authority over large scale projects. The, so, we are left of thinking, let us become coordinators of the multiple actors, state actors that are of value, such as the um, Ministry of Antiquities, who's really active on the ground, maybe empowering the municipality of Beirut, bringing NGOs, international NGOs and donors with local actors and the community. We're creating a web for the project through which we can channel the funding through small packages. Um, it's an unprecedented situation. I cannot tell you we're trained to do this because when we worked on the post-war um, reconstruction of Beirut or post 2006 or in Syria, um, each context has a different dynamics. This is an entirely new one in which the state is totally not involved and not trusted. The international community is not ready to give money. And you cannot leave the people unattended to. So uh, we don't want to leave it to a do nothing scenario. Uh, the people themselves are not in an economic situation where they can repair their own houses. What happens to the public realm? We don't want to create you know, a distinction between the two. So we are, we are trying to work at the neighborhood scale with local government and um, international agencies to create a kind of a web of actors who are focused um, on a single vision. Uh, I hope it works, but we cannot leave it to, to wait for, you know, two years down the line, we get funding top heavy solutions that are packaged outside um, and will be dropped on the people and we cannot leave it um, to chance. So we had to intervene and do the best we can with the little we have. But the situation here is really compounded with the financial crisis, with the COVID-19. When we go to meet the community, it's not what we're used to. So it's online sometimes, it's in the field sometimes, but with distance, it's not the most inducive environment for interactivity. But we will do whatever we can to salvage whatever can be salvaged. Thank you very much, Veda. Thank you very much. And I think that... 
Uh, this was, in fact, the answer to the question of uh, Joseph King as well, who asked you, can you explain a bit more of how you deal with the individual needs of the various communities? And furthermore, was uh, there a need for a sort of conflict resolution between communities as to the actions to take, or was everyone more or less in agreement on the ideas for moving forward? So, um, you yeah. Your, your answer was in fact extremely um, comprehensive and I can find the answer to this question as well, but if you want to add shortly something to this. Uh, quickly and briefly, uh, it's, it's by uh, collaborating and building partnerships with different people because we have uh, a multidisciplinary approach and we involve in our team people who are planners and architects, but you can never cover all these issues. So issues around food security, we're working with the landscape and agriculture program at AUB, issues of well-being and health, we're working with um, volunteer uh, um, doctors. So uh, we try to identify these major issues in, in each community and match them with experts and specialists who can introduce this layer to the framework. So uh, we built the framework incrementally and then we translate it on the ground also incrementally. Great, thank you very much. And I would like to um, ask um, Samira, um, the, thank you very much for the whole set of the um, sort of actions that have to be done in order to mitigate the consequences of these cumulative disasters that affect people and their heritage. So all these actions are somehow um, funded in an expectation that there is a system, that there are um, authorities and uh, all of them are somehow um, back up with this like a need of the capacity building and strengthening the authorities. I'm extremely interested if there are some uh, initiatives by the people, by communities, is there any kind of a, a sort of ad hoc organization of se or self-organization of the people and community to combat the disaster and to deal with the heritage issues, to save the buildings. I've seen some, um, uh, some kind of a small initiatives of a group of uh, young people who were covering the roofs during the flood and these rains with the plastic sheets, etc. So, uh, is it something that exists and how do you think that it might help to a, such a vulnerable society as Yemeni society is at the moment? Yes, Diranda. Yes, of course. We can start with the youth in universities in, uh, in Sana'a, uh, as an example, the, the, law, the public and the private university, we have a thousand and thousand from youth. We can, you know, encourage them to help us in those sites, in old Sana city, also in Zabid and Shibam. Of course, UNESCO is doing great in Sana'a with, with, you know, social funds and development and also with GOFSI. But if we, as Dr. Shadia said, we focus on the youth and, need uh, ask them support they will come and do all these things with you know volunteer they can do it in sana as an example also we can do it in zabid and uh, shibam hadramot uh, yeah that's that's great and that was in fact something that you underlined all the other activities that have to be done uh, through this suggestion that university students and the capacities that universities possess concerning the knowledge and people should be employed in that. So the um, uh, question uh, for Jonathan is in fact uh, similar. You said that in fact this official management of the site was not functioning during uh, to the COVID-19 situation. 
the people were in lockdown, in confinement. Is there any kind of the traditional and still existing system of management and maintenance that might be better than the official one? that might function through the responsibility. I could see that people were reacting to the fire very emotionally, crying, weeping, the, 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 the sort of sorrow because of the loss of the Kasubi tomb of one building through the fire was huge among the people. So I'm interested if the community possess the potential for some kind of this maintaining and taking care after the monument through these traditional models that can be stronger and more vigilant than the formal ones. Yeah, I think um, this is a good question. I think before the fire, um, it has to be said, the management of the site was not really very good. It was not strict, they were not following any uh, say protocol. Um, it was after the fire that everybody looked at the loss and they realized this was part of their of their psyche, of the, of their of the, of themselves. And um, I realized that there was more interest uh, in the building, actually in the, in the Kasui Tools building itself, um, after the fire. And um, after the fire, the systems that I've been recommending, of course, we have the management plan, um, which is, was prepared with the state party and uh, I think also with UNESCO. But I think, of course, the traditional uh, structures that can manage such a site that I've discovered, you've got the different clan members, you've got the hierarchy between the um, hereditary princes. Um, then, of course, now you've got um, the spiritual dimension where you go and sit in, uh, the meeting is called a Masengere meeting, where you sit down and you consult um, elders or people who are no longer with us, but who might give you guidance in terms of the decisions you need to make to run a place or to pick it, to pick somebody in a new place or position. So I think in my view, my personal view, I would recommend the more traditional approach of management as opposed to a system that's more or less, I would say, borrowed in terms of concept from another, uh, not from another civili not civilization, from another society, uh, because that's going to be fought by many people. It will not work. There'll be all, there's always somebody fighting that. So yeah, um, I think if we can emphasize on the knowledge we've picked up on the um, intangible aspects of reconstruction, I think the tombs are going to be very well managed um, going into the future. Thank you, thank you so much. That's extremely important answer for the topic of the whole project conference and the book. And I hope that your contribution to the book, the book chapter will also be important. So the, um, my final answer before concluding and wrapping, by, wrapping up this uh, wonderful webinar will be um, to all participants. Uh, first of all, I, I have one question and I don't know, let me see if Professor, is doc, if Dr. Mactild is still with us. Uh, Dr. Mactild Russler, no. Uh, no, unfortunately, she was called. Uh, yeah, she had to leave. But we have a question what UNESCO is um, doing to help uh, to the three sites in Yemen, three cities, historical cities in Yemen, that are World Heritage Sites. And I think that she uh, mentioned something in her presentation that there are projects, but, you know, it's impossible to... Um, make a sufficient intervention due to this kind of disaster that Yemen is facing with. And I think that Yemen is one of those cases, not the only one, but probably one of the most appealing that uh, demands um, new strategies, new prioritization and new concept of the solidarity and responsibility, world responsibility. 
So um, the uh, all, all what can be listed as a, some kind of help, support, work, and consistent support of UNESCO is a huge. And still it's not sufficient because damages, disaster, destruction is much stronger and much more efficient, unfortunately, than the conservation, restoration, and all the um, assistance, technical assistance that uh, UNESCO and the other international organizations and the other foreign organizations are giving as a support to Yemen. Uh, the uh, final question to all our participants from both uh, panels, uh, if you can just briefly in one sentence, tell me what in these situations, the paradigm build back better means to you? How would you define in one sentence the paradigm build back better? concerning destroyed heritage. So shall we start with uh, Maya, who in fact... I think I, I'm not really sure I have much to add to, to my paper, but I think it's, uh, well, it, it, it is big, built back more resilient. So, um, you know, in a sense, I think all international organizations are working to make ourselves redundant. So, you know, to give communities ability to work on, uh, on the, to protect the heritage that they are custodian of. And of course, you know, I, I'm exaggerating. We will be needed for many years to come, but hopefully uh, our, our function will be more auxili auxiliary um, and more and more the, the local people will be in driving seat. And thank you once again to, to you for inviting me and to all wonderful speakers. It has been a really impressive seminar. Thank you again. Thank you, Maya. Uh, can I ask now uh, Dr. Shadia? We build back better. While yeah, in the meantime, maybe Huveida can answer for this. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to in one short sentence. Again, uh, I said most of it in my intervention. I think we rebuild both the social and the spatial fabric, um, not just the physical. So, and we do it by addressing um, not the pre-disaster uh, condition, but addressing all vulnerabilities and injustices that existed and accumulated over time. So we take this as an opportunity rather than as a crisis. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Samira. You're welcome, dear. Thank you so much for this kind invitation. And uh, sorry if I are sad about Yemen now in this dark period, but uh, this is my voice to, to he I, I hope you all, you know, organization and people uh, see what is the situation now in Yemen. Thank you so much, Dr. Amra. Thank you, Samir. Uh, and Jonathan. Jonathan, we uh, lost Jonathan. I don't know if Dr. Shadia is with us. Yes, I just can't. Uh can't start the video anyway you can you can hear me but i can't open the the, the video for some what reason. a pity yeah <laughs> well anyway um i think um the the presentations um have been um quite uh, not only informative uh, but i would say uh, very realistic about the uh, serious intention of professionals to um, take care of um, the, you know, the urban fabric, the destroyed urban fabric, whether uh, by starting like um, what uh, we have seen uh, in Lebanon, they started even if it's not finished, but it's a very methodical and uh, systematic approach. Um, and uh, also, we had the examples from 
um, Jonathan and others, but I, I would say, um, what can I say without being emotional, you know, looking at uh, Salah and uh, the situation is, is heartbreaking. It's, it's very difficult and uh, indescribable because I also know that uh, city very well. And uh, nevertheless, the only hope we have is that uh, professionals um, are determined to safeguard their heritage. And uh, um, in spite of the difficulties and the challenges and the uncertainty, because they may be um, doing something and rebuilding or, and, and not knowing what will happen the second day. And uh, um, the combination of natural um, um, disaster as well as the result of the destruction, which is caused by the conflict. Um, I would say that uh, this session this afternoon is, is brought us the reality of the situation. Um, we, can, we can also, you know, imagine what Aleppo looks like and what uh, other cities look like, but it is um, encouraging that we know uh, that professionals from Libya and from Syria and from Iraq and, and Yemen and Lebanon and others are determined to continue. And, and the hope is uh, that eventually they will prevail. And um, it's very hard to uh, uh, predict anything in the future, but uh, it, it's important that uh, people, professionals and communities do not stop there. And uh, there is uh, quite a high level of uh, cooperation between professionals and uh, the community and, uh, um, you know, the, the various, uh, um, like in the case of, of Beirut, uh, that training, um, the researchers, the scientists, and in all uh, aspects of, uh, of the, um, you know, not, uh, yeah, of what is needed to fulfill um, the, the, the project that they are planning. So um, it, is, it is hard to, to predict what will happen in the future. Um, the Arab region is going through quite a lot in addition to the COVID-19 and the lockdowns and the increase in the number of cases and, and so on. But life goes on and it's important to see how uh, professionals are handling this. Um, it's the only way to do it. It's just uh, very hard uh, to accept that uh, this is the reality, but it is the reality. And um, from Africa to um, the Middle East, other countries, it is uh, the, the sad situation that we are dealing with. And uh, we still need at some point, maybe Yambra, you can think about that, to uh, be able to gauge the the impact of this on, on the community, on the children, on uh, the residents living in these areas. We still don't know, and it's maybe still too soon, but um, we still don't know, we can imagine um, the human cost of that, whether it's uh, psychological or economic and uh, what have you, but um, the important thing is that uh, when, we, when we, we have a kind of stability anywhere, like uh, uh, maybe Mosul or when they already started also the reconstruction, which uh, we haven't seen much about today. But I mean, we know that from uh, the images that we saw from Dr. Mechtel uh, this morning is uh, that life goes on and people are trying, but still, how did this impact the community? And this is the reason uh, why this uh, webinar uh, was designed. Uh, it's still very difficult to 
what do we, I don't know, research survey, see what the community and how the community is handling this, uh, the displacement, the loss, the fear, and uh, maybe, maybe for years to come, we will not know. And uh, the important thing is that professionals and communities keep trying and continue to be there. I mean, I know that uh, our, uh, our colleague Selma was visiting a number of these sites in Yemen and uh, the reaction of uh, the professionals, uh, Gofsi and others, many of them are very well known to the Arab Regional Center, their determination uh, to continue uh, in spite of, of the limitation and the restrictions. And that is the hope. I mean, eventually we need to know how did this impact the, the, the children? How did this impact the, the residents? And uh, it, it won't happen, I think, until we get a solution. I'm sorry to be so. Um, uh, 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 in, in, a, in a way, it is you, you feel the you can see the positive side uh, signs, and you can see the determination as as the heroic uh, um, efforts that professionals are doing in spite of the heartbreak. We've been there, and we've seen it, uh, and pra actually practically been through it, as you know. And you joined us in in some of our efforts, uh, Amra, in the last few years. It's not hard and it stays with you. And uh, even as a professional, even if you're not the resident, it just stays with you. And these images just brought back images from Nablus, from, from other areas that, uh, and uh, it's all man-made disasters. I mean, you can say what, what you like. I mean, it's just all environmental, cultural, physical, whatever we can see and, and the social, the social uh, impact. It's all man-made and um, um, I have nothing more to say. I'm so sorry, it's just quite difficult. Yeah, in fact, yeah. we have come to the consent that there is not a natural disaster. That disaster is always a man-made disaster. That hazards can be with a natural origin or triggered from the nature, but disaster is always man-made disaster. So um, I would like now to, uh, before like greeting all of you, uh, just to make a very, very brief wrap up. And after that, I will ask all panelists to switch on or during that to switch on the videos because uh, Mohammed would like to take our joint photo just to mark this. Um, so making any kind of a wrap up or conclusion from this first webinar, and I sincerely hope that uh, Arab Regional Center for World Heritage will continue with this practice and organizing webinars before in the framework of the coming conference, before the conference uh, takes place in reality as a face-to-face -face event and that we will uh, identify together the appealing issues and the topics that will be addressed at the webinars. Following the um, success of this one, because it has been a great pleasure to learn from the experience and knowledge of all six speakers today. For me, it was extremely important to understand that this situation of COVID-19 is not only um, a, a cum cumulative, producing cumulative effects to the existing disasters and existing trauma, but sometimes that they are uh, provoking or waking a new inspiration for the activities and new initiatives uh, among the people who are not officially responsible for such initiatives. And having, for example, the urban laboratory as some kind of connection factor for the cooperation of all stakeholders in Beirut, such a small but powerful group 
is an extremely important example. And it can be replicated, and I hope it will be replicated in a similar laboratory established at the Sana University, as Samira suggested. Uh, so it, is, it, it can produce a snowballing effect. So the uh, key words that we have addressed today are community, not only integration of community, but um, attending the needs and potential of the community. Harnessing the potential of community for, from the uh, data collecting phase via the, all the uh, sort of prioritization, negotiation to the implementation and post-implementation period is some kind of a potential, but also addressing the needs of the community first and foremost. That uh, brings us to the definition of heritage or redefinition of heritage. It's always, uh, as uh, all our speakers, starting from Mechfield um, to the uh, uh, and ending with the speech of Samira, it's always some kind of, of integrative approach to both tangible and intangible heritage. And only through addressing, recovering both components, tangible and intangible, and uh, all the attributes tangible and intangible, through the recovery process, the communities are in fact both involved and harnessed, the knowledge is harnessed for the successful process of recovery. The um, uh, Build Back Better, this wonderful 3B that uh, you, some UN uh, agencies like and uh, very memorable, like paradigms uh, concerning heritage has been extremely tricky and uh, challengeable. Does it mean build back better in physical terms? Um, then we have a problem with the authenticity issues, physical authenticity. But if build, build back better is far beyond the physicality and if it attends the meaning of heritage that is like socio-spatial as Hoveida identified it, socio-spatial patterns, then um, addressing the weaknesses of the, those patterns before the very disaster, before the very occurrence of the destructive event through the reconstruction and recovery is in fact applying the build back better um, paradigm in a best way and also building resilience of the community through rebuilding of heritage is build back better approach. Uh, one of the uh, messages from this webinar today, extremely important message, is in fact addressing uh, both needs and potential of the young people, of the youth, through a very systematic, very organized and institutional, not ad hoc approach, that has to be a priority because of the um, qualitative and quantitative potential of this uh, part of the humankind. As Shadia informed us, 50% of the humans at our planet are young people under the age of 30. So these huge quantitative potential is also enhanced through the quality of the addressing to these young people that can be achieved because heritage has sense and the meaning of protection of heritage has sense only if it addresses sustainable development goals. That means working for the better future. At this moment, because we 
um, uh, over time for five minutes. I would like to thank very much to all our speakers, to all uh, those who have attended this webinar and who have supported this discussion through their questions and comments from different parts of the world and different organizations. Uh, I would like to thank very much to the whole team of um, Arab Regional Center for World Heritage, uh, Mohammed, Leila, Salma, Hansa, and especially to Dr. Shadia Tukan, who in fact had this wonderful idea that this is the most appealing issue in the field of taking care of the heritage to be addressed because heritage and people are somehow joined in suffering, in trauma. And this paradigm that is produced through the link of heritage and people is a paradigm that can be used for the improvement of the situation in the world. Uh, I would also like to thank to our translator and once again to our wonderful panelists for the wonderful knowledge that we have received through their presentations. Thank you very much. And see you at the next yes. webinar conference. Thank you, so you will receive the information from our website. Thank you so much, Amra. This has been quite inspiring. I think that's good. No? I think uh, most everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you take our photo? Yes, yes, we did. Please. <laughs> Samira, too? I didn't see. I, I, I think her video is off. No, no, no. We took, we took already pictures. Yeah. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Happy New Bye Year. Happy New Year. Yes. Yes. All of you. Thank you. Happy New Year. We survived 2020. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's true. That's true. Thank you. <laughs> almost. Almost. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Jonathan. Bye.